Blog Talk Radio. J. Raven, and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Uh, Those of you who listen with any regularity know that we cover subjects that are very important to human health, to our environment, to our consciousness, and to help us do what we can to create a better world for one for all. That's our game, folks, here at A Better World Radio and TV. And please go to our website at www.abetterworld.tv so you can also tune in every week to our Tuesday night in Manhattan television show. In fact, we are now celebrating, as of this month, the 20th anniversary of that show being on the air every single week. So please become part of the Better World community and get our newsletter from that same website. A better world TV. So today we are very pleased to have two very special guests on uh, to talk about. We're going to really open up the subject of health and nutrition. Yes, we've covered the subject before, but with every single guest, we always get new ideas, novel information, and a new way to approach the subject in a way that can really make a difference for us. So, with that said, I want to first introduce our first guest, Patricia Bragg. Well, you've heard of Bragg's Amino Acids, Apple Cider Vinegar, and God knows how many, many different products they have had over the years that were developed by her father, Paul Bragg, who was truly one of the leaders, one of the real pioneers in the last century in the United States of promoting a healthy lifestyle. So we have his daughter on, Patricia Bragg, who will be speaking with us about what has come to be known, no bragging, a healthy Bragg lifestyle. And she has been the nutritionist for such luminaries as Clint Eastwood for some 50 years. And you can see how alive and funny Clint Eastwood is if you watched the Republican National Convention last time, and uh, <clears throat> this has a lot to do with the food he takes in his body and his overall health, which is a result of healthy lifestyle choices. And then we have Neil Barnard, MD, who is the author of Power Foods for the Brain, an effective three-step plan to protect your mind and strengthen your memory. He's a New York best-selling author, a clinical researcher, and has been leading the way for making healthy lifestyle choices also, largely around the area of nutrition, so people can have altogether greater longevity, greater health, greater happiness, well-being, and no small thing, a stronger memory into the later years of life. And this is uh, so important, and I really look forward to speaking with Dr. Barnard about that, and you could say picking his brain. He has been an adjunct associate professor of medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences and is president of the nonprofit Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. 
He has been a principal investigator on groundbreaking clinical trials, studying the effects of diet on health, and as a frequent guest on radio and television programs across the country, including a very special PBS fundraising special. So uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have Dr. Barnard joining us today. So I hope that both my guests are on with me right now, and um, I would like to start with you, Patricia. Uh, Patricia Brack, you have been well-known, as has been your father for so many years. I'd love to welcome you to A Better World. Are you there, Patricia Brack? Huh. Hello? Are you there? Okay, okay. Patricia, oh gosh. Okay, maybe there was another number. Patricia, is that you? That's me. Oh, excellent. Okay. Welcome to A Better World. Thank you. Absolutely. A pleasure to have you on. I gave a little bit of an introduction, just a touch of the fabulous work you and Paul have been up to. I mean, Paul, of course, has been a luminary for (laughs) <laughs> over a hundred years at this point, and you have been following in his footsteps and continuing the uh, the pioneering work that he set out on when long before the awareness of nutrition was so important to human health, it would seem to people like us today that it would have been, no pun intended, a no-brainer, but uh, it really took certainly the medical community, to catch on to this. In fact, many are still catching on. But you've been leading the way in many respects over the course of decades. What are the kinds of lifestyle choices, Patricia, you encourage your clients and your students to make? Well, I'd like to uh, say that my father, Paul Bragg, the originator of health food stores and founder of the American Health Movement, uh, Yeah. D. Everett Koop, the retired Surgeon General, that was quite an amazing man, he said, Patricia, your father did more for the health of America than any one person I know of. Mm. And that was what D. Everett Koop told me that. Yes. Now, I'll put it in a nutshell. The Bragg Healthy Lifestyle that my father started is you are what you eat, what you drink, what you breathe, what you think, what you say, what you do. Simple Mm. that in a nutshell. What you eat and what you eat and drink today walks and talks tomorrow. Food is to you. You can either put in health or sickness. It's up to you what you put into your mouth that becomes you. And next is what you breathe. Breathe. Oh, oxygen, the invisible staff of life. And that means no smoking, no secondhand smoke. In yeah. other words, oxygen, the invisible staff of life, gives you energy. We teach deep breathing. We have a book on superpower breathing. Bob Anderson, the leading stretching coach in the world, teaches Bragg superpower breathing, and guess what it does? He said, Patricia, your breathing exercise create Olympic champions. My cousin Don Bragg, the first one to pole vault 16 feet in the world, I was there in Rome when he received a gold medal. For the mm. first one to do 16 feet, you are what you eat, drink, breathe, next is what you say. Woo, words are living. They can so hurt, you could say you could say can what heal. goes into your mouth and what comes out of your mouth. That's exactly right, yeah, Mitchell. Right. You are what you eat, drink, breathe, and then think. Look at this. Think. Woo! I'm t- t- on my brain, not my human computer. Oh yeah. my golly! I keep active, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and even. You have to nowadays in this turbulent times financially. Most Americans overdo on their credit cards. They spend money they don't have. In other words, keep everything keep everything in balance. Exactly, exactly. So just including your including your finances. That you you are what you eat, drink, breathe, think. Your brain, your computer, garbage in, garbage out. I don't watch any murders on TV. I'm not interested in the war pictures. I I I see positive, positive thoughts. You are what you think, and think 
beautiful thoughts, beautiful thoughts, positive thoughts. If to, if it's to be every day, I say to myself, if it's to be, it's up to me. You see, <laughs> to be healthy and fit. And right now, as I'm talking to all of you out there, I'm doing stationary jogging. With every jog, my 70 trillion cells are clapping hands. They're getting circulation. <laughs> and circulation, stationary jogging. I'm Could doing it right now, stationary jogging. What, right you, now as I'm mean... talking to you. And guess what? <laughs> I'm not out of breath. Not out of breath. And I have millions of people at night when they're watching the telly and all yep. over the world for five to ten minutes of every hour they sit, I want them to say sign a pledge. They'll, they'll get up and do stationary jogging for five to ten minutes of every hour they sit in front of the telly. Well, and you know what? Explain. Get, this is new. What, what is stationary what? jogging? That's right. And barefooted, barefooted, right, so, right so in their course, living room. But, so does that mean? Uh, please illustrate that for us. Well, I'm doing it right now, barefooted. Say you're sitting, sitting in front of your telly, and you're watching the night news. Yeah. So yeah. you, so you sat for 40 minutes, then you get up now, barefooted, yeah. and do stationary jogging, and I'm doing it so right now. You just now. stand in place and you move one leg to the other. You 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 go shifting you bounce, weight. You, you bounce up and down your body. Yes, up and down. Okay. So and that's, and that's I have affecting my, your my, lymphatic system. That's exactly. My feet are roughly 12, 12 to 14 inches apart. Yeah. And what you do, you, you you suck in the gut, tighten the butt, lift up the chest, and you use your arms back and forth like you're swinging yes. back and forth. And Oh, and I have some people use 5 or 10-pound weights, and they do a few little weight lifts. Back and I forth, see. up and down, from your Excellent. shoulder, up over your head. And it's a lot of fun, and you should see the testimonies I get. People say, oh, Patricia, I feel so much better. I'm, I've lost some weight. So remember, you are what you eat, drink, breathe, think, say, and do. Yes, exactly. 640 muscles. You either use them or lose them. Now, I want all of you to write this down right now as you listen. And I want you to go, wow, to www.braghawaiiexercise.com. Braghawaiiexercise.com. And then you're going to see the class has been going on all three at Waikiki Beach for 42 years. And it's six days a week. And everybody watching, you're all invited. It's free, 9 to 1030 Six days a week, and, and everyone is invited that's listening, huh? That All we have to do right. is get to Waikiki Beach. That's right, and there's plenty. And we'll do of... stationary walking on the uh, on the airplane. That's actually a very I, good place I, to my do. My dear, it. my dear, no, I go to the back of the plane. Yeah. Back of the plane, and I do stationary jogging on every plane. I've made thirty world crusades around the world, and I go in back of the plane. And I do my stationary jogging. I don't bother anybody. And I do my wall push-ups. And, and I yes. do that in airports. Wonderful. I put, I put my time to good use. And then you in airports, are, if I have Trisha, a layover, yes. You are a lot of fun. And I'm realizing that there's one little note that you don't have in the uh, idiom that you use, which is the value of laughter. I mean, I know you know it, but... Humor, oh my dear, I, and fun. My dear, I have I they when I was a little girl they called me giggles. I te- <laughs> okay. and guess what? I led the Santa Barbara Fiesta Parade fifteen years ago and I'm clown joy to the world. I warmed <laughs> up wonderful. the parade route. Yes, and it's the most prestigious horse parade and they they had never had a clown, but the presidente who was head of Fiesta Week here in Santa Barbara asked me if I would lead the parade and warm the parade up, and I did that. Back and oh, forth. that's wonderful. And you know, e- even 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 members of my family didn't recognize me because I have a rainbow wig, and and I have su- such a garb on you wouldn't know me. It's very colorful, and one leg is turquoise and one is bright orange, 
and then I have shoes with, with balls on them. And I had about 10 helium balloons on my wrist. And I had a lot of fun, and I have little joy clown on a stick. So and he you're talked reminding to all the me children. Of, you're reminding me, Patricia Bragg, of uh, one of my favorite movies and heroes is Patch Adams and the film Patch. Oh, Patch the Adams. I think, Robin yes. Williams. And Isn't the wonderful? value of, in short, feeling good and being uplifted, being elevated in your spirit and in your mind and in your joy and in your humor. And oh, it literally, crazy. and I say this actually to both my clients and my audiences all the time, that when you smile, every cell in your body smiles with you. And those are in the trillions. So that means you are making a large family very happy every time oh, yeah. you smile and every time you laugh. Yes, I I, I I realize that is so very important. I, we talk about the beauty of laughter, and it's so wonderful, so wonderful. And the, the valuable thing is that this is not just, pardon the expression, just talk. I mean, the physiology of laughter and humor has been studied and smiling. And uh, it's so interesting because we really see that there is – um, an increase in cellular respiration, the ability of the cells to excrete waste, and the entire, you could say, frequency, the electrical frequency of the cell is improved and made more vital through humor and laughter. Is that, it's awesome, that, isn't that, it? That is so very true. Give us a little bit of an idea. Dr. Barnard, first of all, let me just introduce you to Patricia Bragg. Well, well it's, good right? to be, it's, it's nice to be with you, and it's nice to hear to to hear from you, Ms. Bragg. Oh, thank you, thank you, and oh, I love all your teachings. I this last weekend you were on national television, and I saw your wonderful presentation. I I'm honored to to be with you on the radio. Well, it's very nice of you to say that. Thank you. I'm so glad. Well, for Dr. Barnard and myself, if I may say, you know. Patricia, you and your father and the entire Bragg legacy is very important to us because it's provided such a major stepping stool for other further research into health and nutrition to develop because there became an atmosphere, an environment of interest in it. And we know that Paul was really central in creating that environment of interest in something that was for way too long marginalized. So we we owe you a debt of gratitude. Patricia. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate that. By the way, the way a smile takes 13 muscles. So yes. when you smile, you're exercising 13 muscles. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So it yes. always keeps no, smiling. No, this, I, yes, you know, I've been nutritionist at Clint Eastwood 55 years now. And, you know, it's it's amazing when I only feel 18 myself. (laughs) Yeah, right. But, see, you know know why? You are defying physics is what you're doing. Well, certainly. But, see, I feel people can go to brag.com and they can go to youtube.com and hear me lecture. Put youtube.com Patricia Bragg. And I make people think. Think with their human computer. You are what you eat, drink, breathe, think, say, and do. And take charge of your own health. And Dr. Bernard, you do a wonderful job. And and Dr. Westerdahl just praises you, praises you. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Wonderful. Patricia, before we let you go, it's very important, I think, for you to give us a little bit of a story about apple cider vinegar and what you feel is its nutritional merits, why people should be, generally speaking, taking it as a daily regimen. Well, it's just amazing. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, uh, used it in 400 B.C., 400 years before Christ. It's a detox, a cleanser, and a healer. And it's amazing, amazing what it does. Our book, Apple Cider Vinegar Miracle Health Systems, is just that. It's followed by millions of people worldwide. Oh, my, oh, my. To the, to what is the, the specific to... recommendation, and what are the specific results that you have um, well, borne witness to over okay, time? Okay, well, it helps promote a youthful body, help maintain a healthy skin. 
and it's amazing. People that have arthritis start get on the vinegar drink, and my yeah. God, it, it 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 disperses a lot of the crystals and and p- parts that are ooh painful. The calcif- calcification. See, that's exactly what it does. Okay. Exactly what it does. And uh-huh. what it what it, it improves your digestion and stimulation. People have GERDs. It gets rid of the GERDs. Dr. Gabriel Cousins started giving it to all his patients many years ago, and he said, Patricia, it was a miracle, a miracle. Oh. And it helps remove the toxins. And, oh, the singers have the Beach Boys on it, Katy Perry. She loves our vinegar drinks. They gargle with our vinegar. And <laughs> what it does, it, the old adage is true, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Bragg vinegar, we've been voted the best all-natural, organic Vinegar, organic, unfiltered, with the mother. And the mother is a miracle enzyme. The miracle mm-hmm. enzyme. In the old days, what they did, they all had it in the old days. But yeah. then they saw the cloud and the vinegar. Oh, they said, it looks like dirt. Kill it. Kill it. So mm-hmm. they boiled it. They killed the mother. They strained her. And that was it. Dead vinegar. Ours is alive and natural. And how do you make it alive? My dear, we, we the mother forms naturally in the vinegar. We age it in bar- oaken barrels, big, yeah. big, ba- big barrels, big, huge barrels, and, and and she forms naturally as she did in Hippocrates' day, mm-hmm. in Hippocrates' day, and and we and oh, she's wonderful, wonderful, and so you know we have many many famous people that that use it, and we have. Julian Whitaker, who has the Health and Healing Newsletter, he said, oh, do as sure. I do, do as I do. Have the Bragg Organic Apple Vinegar drink three uh-huh. times a day. And three that's what times I have. a day. I was going to ask you, what is the the amount that okay, your well, general I take, recommendation is? I, I, you can have two to three teaspoons and eight ounces of purified or distilled water. I do not drink chloridated or fluoridated water. I'm dead against. I'm dead against all GMOs, fluoridation. I'm against any chemical pet pesticides. My father started Odell in organic gardening. Go organic and don't panic. I believe <laughs> in a plant-based diet. That's the way yeah. it is. And see, so apple cider vinegar it has many, 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 many merits. They can they can go onto our website brag.com. Go up to Bragg Vinegar Book, and they can read the contents of all the pages, and they'll get the gist of it all. Plus, we have e-books. And everything we have is reasonable. Yes, it's a it's a very thorough site. It's a very thorough site. Is there something that you could say that you would <clears throat> define as what is the distinguishing characteristic of the Bragg approach to health and healing? Well, we teach people to take control of and be their own health captain. We mm-hmm. our books are are um, we teach them self health. In other words, to take charge themselves of what they eat and what they do with their life, physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And mm-hmm. we balance their life out, and that's what we love doing. Yes. And I'm very proud to be here and to talk to Dr. Bernard. And I have your wonderful book, your wonderful book, and and you've written many books, many books. But Power Foods is a powerful book. Powerful Indeed. book. Indeed. Are well, you in New, uh, Dr. Bernard? Are you in New York City right now? No, I'm in Washington D.C. Oh, Washington D.C. My oh yeah. my. Well, you know we've been nutritionists to five presidents. And I even, uh, one Christmas, uh, Reagan asked me to help come and trim the Christmas tree. And that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. <laughs> Who were yeah. the other presidents that you and well, I your father you, one, were one serving? Of our, one of our fa- favorite ones was Harry Truman. Uh-huh. Harry Truman, back we even visited him uh, in Independence and, uh, and after he had left the White House. And he loved playing the piano. We'd go walking with him and Beth. And it was, yeah. it was wonderful. And I've been to all their their libraries. He has a wonderful library there. And uh, so it's been wonderful. We've been nutritionists to J.C. Penney, 
kept him going to a long life. Dr. Schultz, the foot doctor, almost 100. So we have people, Conrad Hilton, we took him to a long life. And we have the Ford family, Henry Ford, and go on and on, Elizabeth Arden. I could go on. We had the Bates Bedford family, Cannon, Tao family. Dad had a lot of the pillars of America in the early years. And yeah, we had well, all there were so people. few people that were promoting a healthy lifestyle. It, uh, exactly. it just it's wasn't Mitchell. part of the language. Yes, Mitchell. My father was the one that really laid it out simple. We went all over. Dad went all over America, and I traveled with my father for 50 years, and I loved every minute of it. We were on the road eight to ten months out of every year. We lectured in every major city of America and around the world, and every city in the early days had no health food stores. He started the first, named it Health Food Store, keep everything simple, he said. And he, every city he went to, who wants to open the first health food store? This will be the first in Pennsylvania. And he said, you have to have a little retail operation, and we'll put the Bragg health foods in there. And ladies and gentlemen, there will be a health food store tomorrow. And guess what? That was GNC. They oh, had a little really? Laxum yogurt shop downtown Pittsburgh. And he did that all over America. And he put people in business in 24 hours. If they had a little retail operation, he would have a carpenter come in, put some more shelves on. We had the first herbal teas. We had the first vitamins. We had the first wheat churn. We had the first seven grain cereals. Did Paul Bragg know Dr. Gerson? Yes, of course he did. And I know Charlotte, his daughter. And it's yeah, wonderful. Dad knew, knew oh, Dr. Kellogg and his brother. He knew uh-huh. all the old timers. Yes. yes indeed. Oh, yes. Oh, Did he know terrible. Dr. Henry Beeler? Oh, wrote... my dear. Dad was the one that inspired, started Henry Beeler. And Is it, that he was, so? Yes, yes. And he was wonderful. Wonderful. Dad knew all the old timers. And he Dr. Was Barnard, in... do you know Henry Beeler? I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't. No, okay, he, his he, work was, was before his again, work. going back to the 30s, he was really one of the original MDs who got on the bandwagon. My dear, nutrition. that's exactly right, and my yeah. father was his inspiration. inspiration. Zucchini, he was very hot on uh, zucchini juices, I remember. Yeah, oh, he was juice. wonderful, all the but, green juices. All the, and, yeah. and Dad was the inspiration to Ann Wigmore, who st- started Wheatgrass. Of Dad, course. Ed, oh, Lee Lord Cordell. Uh, heard my father lecture in San Francisco and got started. Gaylord Hauser was worked for my father. He came from Germany and came to my father's lecture. Dad was an inspiration to people in all walks of life and inspired That's them to sure. be healthy and to go out and be a health crusader. Yes, exactly. You know, I really, I, I'm glad you're taking a few minutes to go over this, Patricia, because it's really kind of, I think, valuable for all of us, Americans especially, to see that there has actually been a long-time legacy of focus and under, uh, focus on nutrition and the understanding that food really is, as Hippocrates said, our best medicine, which oh, is the name of Dr. Dear, Henry Beeler's that, book. That and, in other words, exactly it's not right. just new. It didn't just come out with the health food um, revolution that happened in the 60s among the hippie movement. It's actually got a long-term history. I mean, Arnold Errett, of course, and the mucusless diet. Oh, now, it he really was my does. father's, and he was my father's dear friend. My father was, the day that he died in, a, in an accident, as he was crossing in the street downtown Los Angeles after lecturing, a car whipped around the corner, and, and, mm. and almost ran him over, and he fell backward and hit his head on the on the curb, and he was gone a minute. Gone a minute. Well, Patricia Bragg, I want to just thank you so much for weighing in so wonderfully with your um, very lighthearted and also comprehensive perspective on well, I, I, the I appreciate components that, of health. I appreciate that, Mitchell. My father, I want to say was the start to Eugene Schiff, Schiff Vitamins. He was the inspiration to Bill Gall, the Good Earth Restaurant, to uh, the Garden Burger young man, and many other people, even Trader Joe. Oh, really? Yes, he was the inspiration 
to many, many people. And Jack LaLanne was his proud oh, student. God, he was yeah. a sickly little boy, 15, been out of school over a year. Oh, he had a, a blinding headaches and boils and carbuncles. He was so weak he had to have a back brace and sit up straight. One lecture at the Bragg Health Crusade, and he heard my father he said, I want to be like him. The whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. you got to get out and exercise. And, oh, my father did some cartwheels, walked on his hands, and Jack said, I want to do that. And Jacqueline, that night, Wonderful. became a student of Paul Bragg. That's beautiful. I well, want to just thank you again, Patricia, for giving us both the history and carrying on the legacy because it's a powerful one, it's an influential one, and you and your father have made a tremendous difference for presidents and all over Hollywood and all over the, all over the country. You've really made a great, great contribution. Thank so, you, Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's been you. an honor to be on your show and I say congratulations, Dr. Bernard, that I watched you on public television. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Wonderful. Patricia, if you'd like to stay on, certainly you may. We're going to turn our attention now directly to Dr. Bernard yes, and his I work. Yes, would, I would like that. I will be part of the Fine. audience. Absolutely. You're most you. welcome. You're most welcome. I want to let everybody know that you are listening to Mitchell J. Rabin on A Better World. We're on every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We love when you join us. We so appreciate your attention and your, your listening to these shows that really are making an impact on people's lives one week after the other. You can visit us at our website and become part of our a Better World family, get our free newsletter every week, which announces our weekly radio and TV shows at www.abetterworld.tv. That's abetterworld.tv, and join in on the fun. Well, I would like to say, Neil, that it's very much obvious to me that the work that Paul Bragg has done, and then following in his footsteps, and actually alongside him, Patricia, have let uh have laid a path that has allowed um thoughtful men like yourself to be able to get grant money and to get the interest of government and other institutes to fund the research that you're doing that I think is so critical to helping us understand such things as diabetes, such things as Alzheimer's, and any number of other kinds of rather standard disorders that can really be remedied with good quality nutrition. So I don't think it's any mistake that the two of you have been guests on today's show. And, uh, you know, there's a historic value to this as well as you leading us very much into the future with the writing that you've done, with the recent PBS special that you've done on Power Foods for the Brain. You talk about an effective three-step plan to protect your mind and strengthen your memory. Do you want to just launch into that, and then we can spread out a little bit from there? Sure, you bet. And I also want to mention that one of the foods that we promote are green leafy vegetables because they're loaded with folate, which is a protective B vitamin, as well as having none of the bad fats, and they're they're good in so many ways. But I have to say, I'm growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, as I did. I never tasted kale or collards. These were just not part of our routine. And yeah. the first the first time that I ever had kale that I thought was really delicious was in a little health food store. And I I bought the kale and I brought it out and I thought this is delightful. What is this What is this on yeah. the kale? And you know what it was? It was Bragg amino acids that had been sprayed on there. <laughs> and for people, for any of your listeners who have not had this, um, it's in every every health food store in the world s- sells this. And oh, it's God, a little yes. it's a little bit like soy sauce, but it just yes. it somehow it it mixes up with the kale and it makes it absolutely like dessert. So anyway, yes. I I am very grateful That's to what the, nice what the Bragg family Thank has you. done because they took right. kale and made it palatable. Um, yeah. But, anyway, um, but you asked yes, about powerful foods for the brain. Um, when I was in medical school, we had the feeling that Alzheimer's disease was not something that could be prevented. It was simply part of old age. 
uh, and dictated to a very substantial degree by genes. There's a gene called the APOE epsilon 4 allele, which will not be on the test. But if you if you've got it, <laughs> you're headed for this. If you've got it, you're headed for this disease. If you don't, uh, you may be spared it. Well, we have learned over the past decade or thereabouts by looking into the human brain and seeing the abnormalities that occur as Alzheimer's disease is forming that it's not just part of aging, that there are structures, abnormal structures forming in the brain. They're called amyloid plaques. And if you looked at them under a powerful microscope, they would look as if they were tiny balls of yarn or little meatballs. They're, they're formed of collections of proteins, proteins that are coming out of the brain cells. This is the beta amyloid. There are traces of metals in them, and they are gradually destroying the brain cells, according to the best evidence that we currently have. Um, is that including, by the way, aluminum? Because it's my understanding that aluminum has been linked with uh, the occurrence of Alzheimer's. When you look into the into the brain of Alzheimer's patients, you do find aluminum. The aluminum does seem to get into the plaques, uh, and it's not the only metal. Copper does, iron does, uh, zinc to a degree. But, but of aluminum, course, all of these are trace minerals that the body needs. So are you suggesting that this would be excess minerals then that are found in the diet? With regard to iron, copper, zinc, yes. You need a little bit okay. of iron for, for healthy red blood cells. You need a little bit of copper for enzyme function. If you don't have iron or copper, you're not going to be healthy. But in even modest overdose, in the same way that iron rusts uh, or copper yes. gradually corrodes, in your body, these metals will oxidize as well. And as they do that, they spin off what are called free radicals that destroy yeah. the brain. At least that's the current theory. Now, I, I do want to so, add... But why wouldn't the body um, naturally just um, eliminate the excess of these trace minerals? Why would they aggregate, let's say, in the brain as this plaque? The, if a person is following a healthy plant-based diet, they're not going to acquire an excess of them in all likelihood. Okay. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the form of iron that is in green leafy vegetables or in beans, it's, a, it's an iron called non-heme iron. And if you have a lot of iron in your body already, the absorption of non-heme iron is reduced. If you're low in iron, the absorption is increased. So your body is able to take this into balance. On the other hand, if you grew up like I did in Fargo, North Dakota, and you were encouraged mm -hmm. to eat meat every day uh, for yeah. iron, the mm -hmm. iron in meat is, is called heme iron, and that's more absorbable than the non-heme iron pretty much no matter what. So you might be iron overloaded, and you'll still you, your body will tend to absorb more and more, which is why uh, people in America where meat is a staple tend to be iron overloaded. Same with copper. It's in liver. It's in uh, lobster and shrimp and crabs, the mobile shellfish, and and so we yeah. th there are a number of sources of it. I, I should say aluminum is not needed by the body. It is a neurotoxin. There is no reason to have it at all. Period. But we do get it in cookware and some and uh, aluminum cans. Aluminum cans, exactly. Uh, some yeah. uh, preparations, certain antacids have aluminum and some other things too. Correct. Correct. Which is a good reason to avoid them. It, yeah, it's a good reason to read labels. It's very easy. You you go to the store, and you say, I have a little acid stomach. You pull out one antacid, and it has aluminum in it. It says right on the label. You look at another yeah. one, it doesn't. Very easy. If you're making yeah. a, a recipe, one baking powder has the aluminum, the other doesn't. Uh, yeah. So it's very easy to make these choices. If you use a deodorant, it doesn't have aluminum added to it. If you use an antiperspirant, it does, and it's absorbed through the skin. But most people don't think about this because they hadn't heard that aluminum could be a problem. Now, I, sh I should hasten to say that when I talk to my colleagues in medicine, there are a number of good, well-respected neurologists who do not feel that the evidence is strong enough on aluminum and not as strong as it is, say, for copper or for iron. And my view of this is, is that while science is sorting that out, it's good to stay safe, to err on the side of caution. Yes. And it's easy to choose the aluminum-free product. So, yes. so I encourage people to do that. Well, I think that's actually an incredibly healthy idea about a lot of things because even such things, and not to deter us, but let's just say genetically modified organisms, while the science is being done independently, which we hope it is being done, um, instead of relying simply on uh, corporately uh, sponsored 
uh, research that until we have real longitudinal studies that let us know of the safety of these foods, we should be just staying away. Your thoughts? We, we should err on the side of caution. We should eat the things that we know are helpful, uh, hel- yes. helpful for us. Um, yes. One of the most striking research studies was done in Chicago called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. They began yes. in 1993, and they, they brought in thousands of people and tracked what they ate. And in 2003, they, found, they reported that those individuals who tended to stay away from what I'm going to call bad fats, mostly the animal fats, saturated fat and the, and the trans fats that are in many snack foods. Those who tended to avoid them had, oh, roughly two-thirds less risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And two when we, thirds. Two-thirds. Yeah. They called, say, around 60 to 70 percent less. And yeah. in addition, they found that people who ate foods that were rich in vitamin E, I'm speaking of certain nuts, walnuts, pecans, almonds, certain seeds yeah. like sunflower seeds and sesame seeds, they also had a substantial protective effect as well. And when I started reading these studies and many others, um, I began to discover that the body of evidence was strong enough that I wanted people to know what these steps were. And my typical way of working was if I just found one small study somewhere, I thought I'm not so sure that we can really hang our hat on it. But when you see consistent evidence from many studies all pointing in the same direction, at some point you have to say, I want to take advantage of this, and I want to see if I can reduce the likelihood that I could develop Alzheimer's disease. And frankly, while I'm younger, I want to have a good, sharp mind as well. Sure. And, and that sure. was the reason that I wrote Power Foods for the Brain, is so that people would Got have this, this information at their fingertips. That's wonderful. I'm so glad you did. It's very interesting, and I really have had a chance to uh, see your your PBS special, which is excellent, and it's a a really fine articulation of the same ideas. But we all know, ironically, that we need fats, and fats are one of the greatest foods for the brain and for the nervous system in general. So what are those fats that you do recommend? Um, it's funny. I, I, I asked the audience in the PBS show, I said, what, what, what kind of fat does the brain need? Because it doesn't yeah. need bacon grease. It doesn't need chicken fat. And so I turned <laughs> to them and I say, you know, what do you need? Do you need, is it sunflower oil? Is it sesame oil? Is it canola oil? Is it olive oil? And I let the audience think about it, and they're all shouting out, it must be olive oil. And I say, well, the answer is, is actually broccoli. Because and yeah. no, I'm kidding a little bit, but you, you don't sure. think about this. If you sent, if you don't think of broccoli, I voted for or, olive oil with that question. Yeah. By the right. way, <laughs> you know you don't yeah. think of green vegetables as having any fat at all. But if you sent That's broccoli right. to the laboratory and you said, "I want to know the the oil content," they would say it's about eight percent of its calories. And what what they mean is that there are traces of natural oils, not just in green leafy vegetables, but also in beans and fruits, just tiny amounts. And what they have. When you eat these on a regular basis, it becomes a substantial amount, and the the oil or the constituent of the oil that's that's most key is called alpha linolenic acid. The thing to remember mm-hmm. about ALA is that mm-hmm. it is it is the mother of all the omega threes. So, fish oil, for example, the fish's body eating plankton. Uh, absorbs the ALA and lengthens it to the DHA that the brain needs. Our body will do that as well. But our body will not do that if we're not eating the green leafy vegetables or the other sources of ALA, like walnuts or soy products. Um, And we'll also have trouble if we eat a lot of competing fats because your body takes that ALA and it lengthens it out. Enzymes will do that. If they're preoccupied with other not-so-healthy fats, then they can't produce the, the natural fats that your brain needs. Oh, that's interesting. So even if you eat, let's say, broccoli, what are the other uh, leafy greens that have that same uh, oil? Vir- virtually all the leafy greens. So, it's, so let's they say all do. broccoli. They all do. greens and kale broccoli. as well. You got it. Kale, okay. collard, so what you're Brussels saying sprouts, is, spinach, all of them. Oh, excellent. So, so I understand. The, I want to see if my brain is still working there, Neil. <laughs> have you had your collards today? Yes, I have. <laughs> Good. Then, I then you'll make have no a trouble green with juice every day, just about, with <laughs> collard no greens trouble. and apples. Yeah. And that's um, only after I have my apple cider vinegar, Patricia. So well, there you are. Please, no. Yes. Um, 
I have a somewhat healthy diet. Uh, but my question to you is, uh, or so I understand, even if you are consuming the healthy fats, uh, if you are also eating the competing fats, the, the trans fats, the bad fats, you are competing with the same enzymatic activity, and you're even eating the healthy ones will be p- compromised. That's right. And, and as a matter of fact, I think that's why people – that's sort of the rationale for fish oil, really. I don't recommend fish, and I don't recommend fish oil. But when people, oh. see benef- when people see benefits from it, I think what they're doing is they're really trying to build up the good fats to counter all of the bad fat that they are getting in cheese and other dairy products, in chicken yeah. fat, in beef fat. And so my point is, what if you weren't eating any of that stuff? Yeah. You weren't eating the beef fat, the chicken fat, the dairy fat, none of that, and you weren't having the fish oil either. What would you be left with? The oils that, that would be left in your diet would be the ones in green leafy vegetables, in beans, in fruits. And those tiny traces, your body only needs a very few percentage, just 2 or 3% of its energy, its calories, from these healthy fats. So it's very, very simple. But Americans get, and not just Americans, but people around the world, get plenty of competing fats. And by the way, not just the ones I mentioned, but potato chips, of uh, things fried in safflower oil, sunflower oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil, all these oils that tie up the enzymes. That's a mistake. Interesting. That's a very valuable point. I appreciate that. Um, so circling back around to the other two points of your three-step plan, yes. not to say we okay. might not come back to oils and fats. Okay, good. Um, we should say a word about exercise. Um, at So step one is to get away from the bad fats and focus on the healthy foods like green leafy vegetables, bananas, beans, and nuts and seeds that give you vitamin E and good good fats. That's step one. And and you're very much in favor of leaving meats and poultry and fish, it sounds, behind. Yes, uh, yes. Why is that about fish? Is that because of the mercury content of fish these days? Well, that's part of it because keep in mind fish do live in what has become – effectively the sewer. I'm talking about the rivers, the streams, the oceans, yeah. where w- when we sample the, the water that the animals are living in, it's it's not very clean. And fish yeah. are carnivores, so the little fish that absorbs a little mercury or lead or pesticides mm-hmm. is consumed by the bigger fish and the bigger fish, so they, it bioconcentrates. That's one thing. Yeah. But the other thing is that people will say, I eat fish because it has omega-3, the good fat. But that's Correct. only 15 to 30 percent of the fat in the fish. The other 70 to 85 percent is not good fat. It's a mixture of bad fat and unnecessary fats. So oh, salmon tends to be fattening, and it's not giving you the good fat you need. So there's naturally – this sounds funny – but they're naturally occurring bad fat. Oh, yes. It's um, not just chemically composed in a laboratory. That's right. In a food laboratory. If, if you, can, you can take the, the most health conscious – Well, of course. What am I talking about? The, you know, animal animal fat. Yeah. Right. The most health-conscious chicken, um, who, a non-smoking chicken. I, I'm teasing a little bit, but, but an organic, you know, happy Cage chicken. Cage-free, exercises regularly. Right. right. Now, yeah. and, and once that chicken is brought to the slaughterhouse and goes through the slaughter process and you take the fat out, and, and if you were to send it to a laboratory, uh, yeah. it's – very high in the saturated fat that is linked mm-hmm. to Alzheimer's disease. Same with beef fat and pork fat, somewhat less in fish fat, but, but there is still a substantial amount of bad fat, saturated fat, in fish as well. Now, I grew up in North Dakota. I come from a long mm-hmm. line of cattle ranchers. They're good, decent Back. people. But I have to yeah. say I, I strongly encourage people to get away from animal products. The healthiest diet is a vegan diet, meaning no animal products at all. And it doesn't have to be punishment. It can be Frankly, it's delightful. Um, later on tonight, I'm going to an Italian restaurant, and I, a group of friends are going to sit around. And I know that the waiter is going to say, would you like a glass of red wine? And somebody yeah. will say, sure, let me have a glass of wine. And then a little salad and a bowl of minestrone or lentil soup. And then when the yeah. angel hair pasta comes by, it will be topped with artichoke hearts and wild mushrooms and chunky tomatoes and a spicy sauce and maybe an espresso for dessert if people want it. The, the point yeah. I'm making is this is not a diet of deprivation. It's very, very easy. Now, yeah. personally, I don't drink alcohol and coffee and things like that, but, but people who right. do, we don't take them yeah. away. Um, what we're mm-hmm. taking away is the bad fats in the animal products and, and emphasizing the vegetables and fruits. If people will do those things, they'll be able to reduce the risk of brain problems later in life. 
Interesting, interesting. We are speaking with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is the author of Power Foods for the Brain, an effective three-step plan to protect your mind and strengthen your memory. And on the earlier part of the show, we had Patricia Bragg of Bragg.com, whose father is Paul Bragg. I, uh, we went into that in some depth, the, one of the founders and pioneers of the health food store movement and the role of healthy lifestyle choices in the United States for so long. And Dr. Barnard is discussing with us how to have a healthy brain and uh, things that we can do to strengthen our brain, to strengthen our memory, which is powerful, by the way. It's actually power itself because power comes through knowledge and the ac- the accumulation of information and its right rightful yep. use. And if our brain isn't working well, nothing else really is. So I very much appreciate this. Now, uh, there's this amazing film you probably know, Dr. Barnard, of uh, – Forks over knives. Mm-hmm. Where yes, uh, a yes, I'm familiar. Strong with it. case, yes, is made, of course, for a vegetarian diet, for a plant-based diet, and uh, you know these uh, these are old pieces of news. Now, needless to say, there are many people who, even in the organic movement, who will make a case for quality organic meat and poultry and fish. What do you have to say about that? Um, I think if you want to feed that to your cat, that would be fine, um, <laughs> b- because your cat your cat is a carnivore. You're not, and what yeah. I'm trying to do. When you say you are not, what do you mean by that? I mean that we are great apes, not carnivores. Okay. Um, if I, I pose this question to Richard Leakey, I don't know if you know his the, the oh, famous sure, pa- paleoanthropologist. Yes. And the the natural diet of humans, if you go way way back, millions of years would have to be very similar to the natural diet of the other great apes, chimpanzees, um, orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, Um, which is to say that we were eating things we could pick with our hands. We weren't out capturing uh, animals. Uh, We weren't milking cows. These were things that we didn't do. We we were vegetarian, presumably. Um, And the other great apes are, for the most part, vegetarian. Um, So I asked Dr. Leakey, I said, how did meat-eating begin? And he said... He felt it was, it, it was not natural to us. If you look in the human mouth, our canines, we don't have the canines that a dog or a cat has. Our mm-hmm. canine teeth are no longer than our incisors, and that change occurred at least three and a half million years ago. Um, but meeting presumably began once we had stone tools that could do what, what sharp teeth might mm-hmm. otherwise have done. And, and so we could Such once, as knives. Well, knives and, and, and cruder things. But what we yeah. would do is uh, maybe find yeah. a kill that a lion had left behind. You'd scrape right. some of the meat off the bones, and you'd be able to eat it, starting by scavenging. Um, yeah. And fire then made it easy. And you'd think, well, it's been a long time since the Stone Age began, but the fact is we have pre-Stone Age bodies. So to this day, to this day, when you get away from meat, uh, dairy products, and so forth, your risk of many conditions drops quite dramatically. Yes, I understand. But, you so know, other, then there's other, the work of not, Dr. Weston meeting. Price, which you're probably also familiar with. Dr. Weston Price, who is a dentist who traveled around the world. And it's not like I'm trying to make a case, but I'm I'm enjoying you. And I'm, I'm just putting forth a couple of different perspectives. Uh, he studied the teeth of indigenous peoples, which were so much stronger and healthier and whiter and better aligned than the Anglo teeth, where we have so much salt and sugar and bad fat and, uh, and uh, refinements in all of our uh, processed foods and the like. And he did a study going back, was it perhaps the 30s, certainly the 40s, and in his diet, there was a tremendous emphasis on oils and fats naturally occurring and healthy ones such as nuts and legumes. But also, if I'm not mistaken, the use of butter is part of his dietary regimen based wholly on those of the indigenous peoples from across the world that he studied. There's the use of eggs and there's also meats. 
um, before we get get too crazy, um, let, let me first say that that butter is a dairy product. That means it comes from cow's milk, and people across the world were not milking cows um, historically. Uh, dairying began oh maybe six thousand years ago, something like that, in mm-hmm. northern in northern Europe. And many, many people have had a lot of trouble with it because of the natural lactose intolerance um, makes it very hard to digest milk. Now, a genetic mutation gradually occurred so that a number of white people, not all, but most, were able to digest lactose at least through much of adulthood, whereas for blacks and Asians, um, lactose intolerance is still the rule. Um, Dairying has gradually spread, and within the current generation, it's now spreading to Japan and to China and other countries Mm -hmm. where milk and ice cream and butter were previously unknown. And what is happening in these countries as their rice and plant-based diet, largely rice and plant-based diet, is being changed so they are consuming less and less rice. And dairy, as you mentioned, is coming into their their diets. Uh, Meat is coming in in a bigger way. What is happening is the most tragic natural experiment. People are getting fatter. Diabetes rates are going through the roof. Um, Heart disease is going up, and life expectancy is diminishing. So it's Mm. a terrible model. And in in the work that we have done, uh, 10 years ago we were funded by the National Institutes of Health to put to a very careful test for people who already had type 2 diabetes, most of whom were overweight, had high cholesterol and other problems, to actually try a plant-based diet in these individuals and to compare it against what I'm going to refer to as the American Diabetes Association diet. This is the standard or standard diabetes diet. And yeah, the, plant-based, diabetes the plant-based diet, diet was far better than, than the other. It helped them lose more weight, get their, their blood sugars under better control. And although it's entirely against the biases with which I grew up, which yes. were very similar to what you articulated. You ought to have meat and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Uh, those were the things that I had believed. Um, I was wrong. And we now know that a plant-based diet is, is ideal. And t- t- just so people know what we're talking about, the foods you need are vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, those four groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes. You should take a vitamin B12 supplement. Everybody should, regardless of diet. You need it for mm-hmm. healthy nerves and healthy blood. And if you follow those rules, eat those four f- food groups, and make sure you got B12. You've got really an ideal diet. Now, we can get much fancier, and that's what Power Foods for the Brain is about, to show you how you can really fine-tune this and do well. Um, But anyway, I hope that that message really comes through loud and clear. Oh, you've done a beautiful job of it. Absolutely. Now, um, I want you to, if you would, you had exercises that you mentioned for the brain. So you've got the avoidance of the bad fats, which are the saturated fats and the trans fats. You have the second point that you yeah, the, want the us to The second point is, is really digest. physical exercise, yeah. Um, I encourage right. people so, to lace up their sneakers and get the heart pumping so that you get yeah. oxygen to the brain. And the third issue is to look out for brain threats. Uh, certain medicines, even cholesterol-lowering drugs, although they, they certainly are effective for lowering cholesterol, one of the side effects that they sometimes do have is to affect the brain. Other medicines can do the same. And if you don't know which medicines are which, then you have nowhere to turn when you start to, to develop brain problems. And so that's the goal. Okay, so you would say that um, brain exercises is really physical exercise that is having an impact on the brain because it's oxygenating the brain. That's right. And, and then also uh, there are brain exercises themselves. Uh, we know that people, for example, who do crossword puzzles and the Sudoku yeah. or people who speak more than one language, uh, they yeah. have th- their likelihood of developing um, cognitive problems. It's really put off by several years compared to other people. Isn't that interesting? And the playing of music is another example of um, another cognitive skill that you want to keep the connections alive. That's right. Function. Keep the right? connections alive. Exactly. Exactly. That's wonderful. Well, what are your final thoughts for us? What would you like to have our a better world audience really, pardon the expression, digest? Uh, I think the most important thing is don't wait. Uh, when were, did you get your first wrinkle or your first gray hair? These things don't start when you're 70. They start when you're 20, 30, 35. Um, your brain is changing too. 
And so is the, for, that's also true of the people that you love. And so if we throw the animal products out, if we eat our healthy fruits and vegetables, if we look after ourselves and get physical exercise, we can not only be slimmer, we can not just look better in our exercise outfit, we can not just be healthier, but we can have a healthier brain as well. And I hope that we'll take advantage of this information that we now have. Exactly. Before I let you go, I would have another question about eggs because they they fall as sort of this in-between category. And I know you mention it in your PBS special as something to be avoided. But some have felt that eggs are actually a rather perfect food. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, When the egg is laid, everything is in that egg to make a complete chicken. I know this sounds funny to say, but everything that you need yeah. to make a beak and feet and feathers and a liver and bones is all inside right. that egg. And so that uh-huh. means a huge amount of cholesterol, fat, and protein. And it's highly concentrated. There is more cholesterol in an egg than in an 8-ounce steak. So steer clear of it. I, oh, okay. I wouldn't go anywhere near But do, doesn't the brain require cholesterol for its operation? It does, and your liver makes all the cholesterol that you need. The body tissues make it. When you eat, when you feel you must swallow more, your body gets very disappointed in you because you're making enough. When you eat more, you get an excess, and that you don't need. That's so interesting. Well, Dr. Barnard, I so appreciate your input and your sharing with us today on the ideas behind power foods for the brain, and your work is just really exemplary. So please, please, you know, stay the course because you're making a wonderful contribution to us all. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your helping get the word out. Absolutely. Dr. Barnard, thanks again for joining us. And Patricia Bragg, if you're still there, I want to just thank you as well for joining us today and sharing your insights and your experience with us on a better world. And she's not there, so I want to thank her anyway. And thank you both. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. I so appreciate your joining us today. Remember to visit us at our website at www.abetterworld.tv. This show is archived at that website and Blog Talk Radio, so you can listen to it anytime, and you can take the link and forward it to your friends and family. I am sure you know people who could really benefit from this information, and Dr. Barnard's book is available on our website as well at abetterworld.tv, just right near the link, you'll find it. Thanks again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all next week.